Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we're going to be taking a look at Death is the New Pink, which is a book put out by Mike Evans, who is the creator of the hubris role-playing game that you may remember from uh, a review I did previously. I really like that game, so I'm very excited to see what goes on in this one. And it's basically a version of the Into the Odd system, which I really liked. And it takes it and puts it into a apocalyptic, goofy wasteland, similar to what you might see in Mad Max or in Fallout. Here's our back cover here. Sustained a little bit of water damage due to the mail carrier leaving it out in the rain. And it has a lot of great art, um, especially the art done by Jeremy Duncan, which we can see on the cover here. He's one of my favorite OSR artists. He has this very uh, gritty, very Baroque, detailed style that I think fits really well with the tone. Now, this is a copy that was sent to me by the author to review. You can see all the artists here. And uh, one thing I really like about this game is that for the most part, the uh, layout keeps things on a one or two page spread, meaning there's a lot less page flipping. Whenever there's a topic, it usually ends at the end of the page, which is great for referencing stuff. You can tell that attention was paid to that when this book was being laid out. I do wish that maybe a little bit more uh, care had been put into the design of each page in terms of like the font choice and um, things like that. It looks fairly plain. It doesn't really catch your eye in that sense. But the writing itself is very clear and easy to read. So it has the starting package system, which Into the Odd uses. And the basic idea here is that you look at your highest stat and compare that to your hit points. And then it tells you what package of stuff you start with, which makes character creation really fast. I do wish that these had both been on one page, though, because it's a little annoying to have to flip that. You don't see that in most of the rest of the book. Uh, just briefly going over how the Into the Odd system works is you just have three stats that are from 3 through 18. You just roll 3d6, and you try and roll under them on a d20 in order to do stuff. Very simple. Um, in order to do attacks, the quirk of the system is that you do not roll to hit. You just roll damage, and then you just hit their hit points directly. This makes combat really fast and deadly. Um, once their hit points get down to zero, excess damage starts hitting their strength stat, which is called badassery in this case. And once that gets down to zero, then you actually die. However, every time you take critical damage, which is when your strength stat loses some points, you have to try and make a check. You try and roll under your strength in order to see if you stay conscious. It's a very clean, very simple system. And it makes stat blocks really short and easy to write. We have some basic equipment lists here, including up to, you can get some armor. Armor here uh, just does damage reduction. So the maximum armor that you can get is three. Normally you don't have better than two. So armor helps a little bit, but it's not really gonna save you in a fight. Saving yourself in a fight means being very careful about the fights that you get into. Into the Odd in general has a lot of fantastic principles and advice for running OSR games. Uh, when I was first writing Maze Rats, a lot of my concepts about how the OSR works were derived from Into the Odd and from its author, Chris McDowell. We have doodads, which are basically magic items and uh, powerful doodads. We have stuff like the clone tank or a cybernetic eye or a plasma shotgun. And they all do something weird, possibly dangerous, but they often give you interesting tools that you can use in order to deal with the environment in creative ways. We have muscle ups, which are basically like the perks from Fallout. Once you get to a certain level, you can start getting these perks. I love that little Fallout touch there, including things like uh, try to hit me. So now you can start dodging stuff. Normally you can't actually dodge attacks because uh, damage just hits you automatically. Or you can become a mechanic, which allows you to fix things faster. You can get some psychic powers. And of course, you can get mutations uh, by rolling on what, what uh, part of your body gets a mutation and then what happens to it. So for example, you might roll uh, your legs and then roll that they are now furry. And that can just be cosmetic, or you might be able to get some mechanical benefit out of that. You'd have to ask the DM. However, every time you do get a mutation, you're gonna lose some of your charisma, which is called moxie here, because you're getting uglier and weirder. Basic summary of how the rules work. I believe in the Into the Odd uh, rule set, it fits all of these rules on one page. It's a little bit more spread out and a little bit more explained here, but the rules are very simple to grok. And we have how you get uh, levels here. So you don't actually get XP here. 
I like that it's more mission based. It's there's very specific of what you have to do in order to gain a level. So to get the first level, which is lean bacon sandwich, you have to survive at least one adventure into the waste. And then once you get to three adventures, you become a quarter pounder. I, I think it's hilarious that this is done as like a fast food menu. I don't know why that's so funny, but it's great. Um, then you can gain muscle ups. You start getting perks. And eventually, in order to get to even higher levels, you have to start doing things like recruiting an NPC that's like your apprentice, and you start training him to also be an adventurer. So I love how it sort of ties the characters' lives into the setting that way. Basic rules for how money works. Money is done in copper, silver, and gold, which feels a little too D&D &D to me. I would have done something like bottle caps or some other weird currency, but obviously that's simple to re-theme. Uh, there are some simple rules for starting your own business, which is really neat if you want to start an enterprise in the wasteland, and some rules for running gangs, so like little raiding parties, um, so that you can actually have gang against gang warfare. We have rules for vehicles and car chases, essentially if you're gonna do any sort of Fury Road style game, and for getting irradiated, along with some sample hazards. Uh, a great thing about Into the Odd is that it emphasizes the fact that the main point of the game is player choice and player decisions. So if there is a trap or a danger and players are moving carefully and they're you know searching, then they're just gonna automatically find everything. If they're moving really fast and carelessly, then the traps will just get sprung on them and they'll have a bad day. But normally they're just going to see traps automatically. And the challenge is going to be, how are you going to disable these things or get past them rather than rolling perception checks all the time? And I've always loved that rule. And I'm glad to see that it's here too. Looking at some bad guys, which are called Nefarios. Uh, they have all your basic stats. Um, you can assume that all their stats are just 10. And um, so they're really fast and easy to make. They all have a drive, and we have some examples here. So badass psychics, bomber slugs, a butcher, right? Very simple, straightforward uh, stat blocks with just one um, drive, so you know what they're up to, and then a short little paragraph describing how they might be used in play with any little quirks. Chicken bears, the emaciated lady. And for the most part, they do something weird. They all do at least one weird thing that you're going to have to learn to deal with when you encounter them. So it's never just going to be a rolling back and forth. I do damage, you do damage. You're going to have to think about how you're approaching these monsters before you deal with them. Even if it's only one thing that can make all the difference between a boring fight and a fun fight. Super scientists. And we have Scratch Town, which is our main setting our apocalyptic wasteland town with people from scratch town. You can roll on this table to uh, create your own. So you can have a blue tint who likes playing with fire burns all over his body. And he wants to establish a merchant caravan business. And we have a mission generator. This is great. Uh, very few games seem to actually have mission generators. I'm not really sure why, but they don't seem to often have that. It's a little strange. But it's such a huge help when you're DMing a game that you can make missions that are varied and interesting on the fly. So you can choose who's doing the, uh, the hiring here. For example, maybe a merchant is. And then what's the goal? What is he trying to do? He wants to escort someone. We're on the next table. Who is he? Um, so let's see, 2C and then 2D. So you have maybe another scoundrel wants you to escort. So you're trying to escort a scoundrel, rather. And you can roll over here to say, uh, you're trying to escort him to the catacombs. So there you got a mission right there. He has a couple examples here. And we have a starting adventure, which I actually really liked. I'm usually very skeptical of these starting adventures in role-playing game books, but this one is really thought out. And you can tell that just by looking at the design here. It's like a catacomb raid underneath the city through like the sewer system. It's full of weird stuff, similar to what you might see in the underground and into the odd. But you can see that from the map here, there are a lot of loops built in, right? There's a like, loop here, one here, one here, right? one over here. So there's more than one way that players can tackle this environment. It's not just a string of one room after another, with maybe some stuff branching off. It's more like a maze. So players, if they don't like going in one direction, they can choose to go in another, maybe loop around from another angle. I think that's a pretty essential part of creating any sort of environment. 
And the rooms give a lot of variety, and variety is one of the key things that I look for. So there's straight up dangerous stuff that'll just try and eat your face, but there's also friendly NPCs that'll help you out. And there's things that are in between. You have factions that want stuff and could be very dangerous or it could be really helpful depending on how you deal with them. There are plenty of interesting items and equipment that you can, that you can find in here. And by the time that you're well into this adventure, you're gonna be stocked up with enough information and possible allies and enemies and items that things are gonna go off in unpredictable directions and players are gonna be able to um, really forge their own way and use the stuff they have creatively to try and solve problems. I love this little monster here at the end in one of the rooms. It's the Roboseptic 3000. It's a cleaning robot that's gone berserk and is now uh, crazily cleaning everything in this dungeon. And he will try and clean you right out of existence if you let him. So he'll try and mop your face and blind you. And then he'll try and uh, use a water hose gun against you or he'll try and you know scrub your skin right off. It's hilarious. We have some rules for traveling around outside in the wasteland with a quick uh, weather table and some random encounters for all sorts, of use, all sorts of stuff that you can find in the wilderness with their stats attached. And that's great because you don't have to look stuff up on other tables. The stats are just right there. Some cool locations. And then you have your appendix N at the back. So as I mentioned, it, it takes stuff from the Fallout series, but also the Borderlands video game, um, Judge Dredd, uh, Thundar the Barbarian, and so on. So that's my review for Death is the New Pink. I love the system. I've loved the system for a long time, and the setting seems like a really good match for it. So if you want a fast, light, and deadly apocalypse game that does not take itself very seriously, this is one of my favorite books for doing that. So I strongly recommend that. Um, as always, a link will be down in the description below for where you can check it out for yourself. Um, before I go, a special thanks should go out to all of my patrons, especially Brendan Scott, who recently became a patron and is doing an awesome job supporting the channel and keeping this whole enterprise going. Thanks so much, Brendan. You're awesome. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you want to get all of my videos as they are released. And thanks, everybody, for watching. I'll see you guys next time.